Many are called, but few are chosen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The chosen few is where that comes from in our scriptures to hear that we see. And what does it mean by the chosen few? It's not meaning that some people are picked out from others, uh, you know, meaning that you know some are going to, no matter what, be, be cast down and cast out into the, that where it said the weeping and gnashing of teeth, but rather what it means is what we can see in the Latin, you know, that it says, you know, the, the, the truly elect of those, meaning that these are the people that weren't only called, but also followed that call, that also did the things that they were required to do to be pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. And we are always looking for this for ourselves. We're looking for how we can ensure that we don't stay merely as called individuals, but we truly embrace that point of being the chosen, the elected. We look to do this by doing God's holy will in our own lives. And this seems like such an achievable goal for us. It seems that way as long as it stays easy, as long as it's something that we can do with very little difficulty, we're all on board to do God's will. But as soon as it becomes hard, that is when it separates those who really are the elect from those who are merely called. That difficulty, those trials in our lives, are through which we can truly follow God's will. When providence ordains a hardship to be endured, how do we react then? And it's in those moments that it matters the most. Well, I dare say that it is the crosses that choose those who are truly chosen. Now, nowhere is this exemplified more than in the story of the saints, which we celebrate in tomorrow's feast. That is, the North American martyrs, these great martyrs for the faith, somebody, people who died right here on our own soil, are the ones that exemplify this in such a clear way for us as, a, as Americans. From the outset, there was no question as to the fact that their path would be one of embracing the cross. St. Isaac Jogues was asked a question on the day that he joined and was professed in the Jesuits. He knelt there and made his profession to his superiors and with his vows and everything, and the superior looked at him and asked him a, a, a little bit of a curious question. He asked him, what do you want, what do you desire from the order, from joining the order? And St. Isaac Jones' response was very interesting. He said, Ethiopia and martyrdom. He had no qualms about the fact that he was willing to give everything, even his very life, for the faith. And not only his life, but we see by the superior's response, he was ready to give of his own will for the sake of God. Because the superior responded, not so. You will receive Canada and martyrdom. And those words rang so true because soon he became that missionary over to the new world, set, coming into Canada. And that great sacrifice that he was to give which he knew he would have to give, began right away. He was not allowed a moment's rest upon his arrival in the new world. He came in, St. John de Berbeuf, another Jesuit saint, uh, another of the, of the holy martyrs, was already here in Canada at the time, and he met St. Isaac Jogues when he arrived. And St. John de Berbeuf had already started to learn to, to know and understand the way of the, these, the Huron I Indians, and so he kind of helped St. Isaac Jokes to adjust to that. And he, when the ship landed at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, that's where St. John de Berbeuf met him and, and welcomed him. And they were to journey the entire way down the river to come into uh, that, you know, Ontario province, province there and also part of northern um, New York State to, well, today, that there were, that was the area that they had to travel down a long distance down the St. Lawrence River. And they embarked on it in a dugout canoe, wobbly dugout canoe, 
that they had to sit on their hunches. And St. Chandra warned him at the very beginning, don't move, don't adjust yourself, don't try to you know, undo your legs to make yourself more comfortable, don't even make a sound as this is going to be uncomfortable, because in that, the Hurons will sense weakness. And if they sense a weakness in you, they will not only dismiss you, but probably will kill you for that fact, because they accept the teaching of Christ because they see in us that strength that Christ has given us. And so they rode for days down that river, sitting on their haunches, not being able to move or make a noise at all. And yet this sacrifice, which for many of us would be something nearly impossible, was just the beginning of all that he was to endure in this new missionary life. Um, those sacrifices increased. The Hurons demanded much out of these great Jesuit missionaries, yet they were open to the preaching that they gave. They did convert. They did receive baptism. Many uh, came and embraced the faith. Yet they were not the only tribe in the area, and the Iroquois, a much larger tribe, was vehemently against it and and very uh, very violently against it. And it's you know soon after his work had begun there, these Iroquois Indians oftentimes would come and attack, and at one point they captured two of the Jesuit missionaries. It was St. Isaac Jogues and uh, St. René Goupil, and who was a, a lay brother with the Jesuits there. And the, what they were doing, they were traveling down the river in, a, in, a, in canoes, several of the canoes with other Huron Indians, and the, the Iroquois came out of nowhere and, and forced the canoes to the shore and began to attack. Well, the, the Indians, the Hurons, that is, they hid St. Isaac Jones. They knew he's the priest. We need to hide him. We need to protect him. And they put him over in the, in the bushes, and he was safe there. But what he saw, he knew that he could not remain there in the safety. He had to sacrifice his own well-being for the good of others. He saw many catechumens uh, of the Hurons being captured by the Iroquois, and he knew that they were going to torture them. He knew that they were going to try to make them give up their faith, and they could possibly die. And so he wanted to ensure that he was there to strengthen them in that way, and also to provide them with baptism, if need be. And he also saw that his companion, <coughs> René Goupil, was captured along with them, and he could not leave his companion alone in that. And so he came from the bushes and gave himself up to the Iroquois to accompany them to what they, he knew was going to be a very um, trying and painful time. And right away, the, the, the pain was started as soon as they arrived. They were beaten mercilessly all throughout the, their, their journey with the Iroquois. And when they arrived at their camp, they were put through what is known as the gauntlet. In, the, in that, they beat them with clubs and knives and, and, and burning torches, you know, as they had to run through two lines of these people hacking and, and, and attacking them on either side. And St. Um, Saint Isaac Jogues ran first, and he made his way all the way through and, you know, with, with scarcely hardly enough strength left, makes it out the other side, beaten, bruised, cut, and battered, really uh, in, a, in a very bad way. Well, he turns around and looks. This gives you an idea of the sacrificing nature of St. Isaac Jokes. He turns around and looks and sees St. René Goupil, who was much smaller than he was, and who was uh, of a little bit of uh, frailty of health. And St. René, under the attacks, had fallen down and was unable to get up on his own and was being beaten while on the ground. So St. Isaac Jogues turns around, having made it through the gauntlet himself. He turns around and enters back in to, the, to that fray and is, receives the beatings all again in order to help pick up St. René and carry him to the end, lest he die right there. Well, St. René soon would gain that very crown of martyrdom because one day they were taking a walk together and one of the greatest hardships and heartbreaks of St. Isaac Jogues came through. They were walking down by the river, and this is actually a trail that you can go see if you ever go to Orisville, New York. 
that you can walk down the same trail that they were on going towards the river. And you can read excerpts from uh, St. Isaac Job's diary about that very day where they're walking down and two Iroquois jump out of the, the brush and they command them to go back to the camp where they were, where, where they were being imprisoned. And so St. Isaac Jogues turns to go, and so does not St. René, but one of the Iroquois swings his hatchet and hits St. René Goupil in the head and then hits him a couple of more times, uh, thus giving him that great crown of martyrdom. And St. Isaac Jogues, though heartbroken, realizes that he must do all that he can to give the proper burial to St. René. And so he sneaks out the next night to find his body down by the river, and he brings it to a separate location and covers it up with rocks until he can get enough time in order to give it a proper burial. Well, the next day he comes back again, and the body is gone. The, the, the Indians had moved it because they knew that he wanted to bury it well. But, and, it, and it broke the heart of St. Isaac Jokes, but he didn't give up. He kept looking, kept searching. It took him months. It happened in September, and it had to wait all the way until the springtime, until he was finally able to find St. René's remains and give him that proper Christian burial that he deserved, giving honor to those relics there of the first of the, of the eight martyrs of North America. In addition to those, the beatings, the Indians, the Iroquois Indians, being superstitious themselves, saw the priest, if he would offer mass, would keep his fingers together. And so in that, they, they one of the other tortures that they imparted upon St. Isaac Jokes was that they uh, chewed off and gnawed off uh, his, his fingers, his uh, index fingers, and his thumbs. And um, at one point along the way in his imprisonment, he became so weak they thought he was going to die. And so other French uh, men were able to actually sneak him out and get him to escape. And they put him on a boat and sent him back to France, thinking that he could maybe at least die on French soil. Well, when he arrived in France, he began to actually recover and regain some of his strength. But because of all he endured... He was almost unrecognizable to the point that he was there with another Jesuit priest who had known him before he had gone over to the New World. And he was there talking with this priest, and the priest didn't recognize him. He had heard rumors about this, this haggard, poor-looking man and said to him, you know, is it true that you came back from Canada? And he said, yes. And then he asked him if he knew Father de, Bre de Brebeuf. And he said, yes, I do. I know him very well. And then the man said, do you know Father Jokes? And he says, yes, I know him extremely well as also. And then the priest asked something interesting afterwards. He said, is he still alive? And then St. Isaac Jones said, yes, he's still at liberty. And then he gave a great pause and looked at his old friend and said, in fact, it is I who speaks with you now. And at that point, finally, his his arrival back in France had become known, and he was no longer able to pass around in, in quiet. People would actually cut off pieces of his hair and his, and his cassock to keep for themselves, knowing that they had uh, a martyr who had not given up his life quite yet, walking amongst them. The queen of France herself kissed his mangled hands out of reverence for all they had given. And when he applied to the Pope to be able to say Mass, even though he was missing his canonical fingers, the Pope said in his giving of permission, it is unbefitting that a martyr of Christ should not drink the blood of Christ. And with that, St. Isaac Jogues applied to his superiors to go back. He could not stand staying there idle in France, but he truly loved the souls of the Indians. And he went back to the, to the New World, proclaiming, I shall go and never come back again. And he finally did complete his martyrdom after uh, enduring more tur tortures by being slain like his friend St. René with a hatchet. St. Isaac Jogues suffered so much, but his sacrifice saved a great number of souls. And that was the reason why he was willing to undergo so much, for the good of souls. And that's why all of those Jesuits came to the New World. St. John de Berbeuf 
who was the first to arrive, said after his first baptism, he had, there was a young Indian girl who was dying of an illness that he was able to baptize there. And it was his first baptism there amongst the Indians. And he said, I would come and suffer all things just to save this one soul. That was their purpose. And I've told you a shortened version of the life of St. Isaac Jokes. Yet he's only one of the eight that died as martyrs of those North American martyrs. And he's only one of many of great missionaries from the Jesuit order that came and converted those people in the new world. But their example is where we can find strength for ourselves to bear our crosses well. It's by reading their lives and meditating on those aspects, which I encourage you all to do, that we can see where we should grow in our own spiritual life. Because how well do we carry our crosses? That's the question we have to ask ourselves at the end of the day. Now, we're not going to have to run the gauntlet. Chances are nobody's going to hack us to death which, with a hatchet. But it doesn't mean we're not going to suffer. If we want to be like Christ, if we want to follow in his footsteps, we can't ignore Calvary in that walk. Sometimes our crosses are going to be there in ways that we can't avoid them. Sometimes we're going to be the ones that have to have that little talk with our children or our godchildren and provide that point of correction to them. Sometimes we're going to have to be the ones who have to avoid a family wedding in order to stand up for the faith, knowing that that wedding was going to be invalid or, or have something evil in that regard. Sometimes we're going to have to be the ones that are strange in the eyes of others because we don't go along with the ways of the Novus Ordo. Or we have to sometimes fight against those modern ideas to embrace what we know to be true, to stand for moral principles which very few ever stand up for any longer. Sometimes we're going to have to fight very hard against our own daily temptations. Yet all of these, when carried well, are our crosses. These are the things that we're called to bear. These are the ways in which we follow Christ's footsteps. And in doing so, if we do these things well, it's in that way that we are not just called, but it's in that way that we truly become the chosen few. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.